behave and dismantle its form of government, abandon its revolution, get rid of the Castros, freeze the prisoners that the U.S. considers political and implements a multi-party system on the island. This scornful paternalism is precisely the problem because again, Cuba does not belong to the United States. I have a friend who's in the audience somewhere, Manuel Gomez, a Cuban-American like me, he came to the United States as a little boy. He had the misfortune to go to a little town in Alabama called Silacaga. Which, <laughs> in, in, you know, in Spanish, that's terrible. I mean, it's, if you defecate, isn't it? <laughs> but that's where he grew up before going on to Harvard. But, you know, Manolo correctly points out that this idea of nations behaving the way that Washington wants is the way that parents treat children and not the way that nations conduct business. And our foreign policy ought to be conducted on geopolitical principles and not on the basis of any kind of paternal domination. There's been instances of it, and I think Mr. Smith, Wayne Smith, can attest to this. Back during the uh, Ford administration, Henry Kissinger, of all people, um, wanted to talk with Fidel Castro without any preconditions. Um, but it's rare. Always, always, there are preconditions um, in, in any attempt to speak to Cuba on the part of the United States government. This in spite of many issues that are of common interest. We have issues of trade, immigration, drugs, terrorism, travel, prisoners. All of these things can be discussed in geopolitical terms, in terms of what is in the interest of each nation, and not in terms of the United States is going to impose its will, its form of government, its way of thinking, on a country that frankly doesn't want anything to do with that. I'm not going to go into all of these issues because we don't have time, but I want to mention one, and that's the issue, issue of prisoners. I want to mention it for a couple of different reasons. Barack Obama, who may be the best uh, guy to come around in a long time here in Washington, Obama has said he will speak to Cuba without preconditions, yet he always sets a condition whenever he speaks about Cuba, and that is the release of prisoners. And anybody who's followed Cuba for any length of time, and I think Dr. Smith will attest to this, knows that Cuba also raises the issue of prisoners. Cuba talks, as Eugene so rightly put it, about the Cuban Five. The political prisoners that Cuba is talking about are here in American prisons. And the United States responds that there are prisoners in Cuba. It's always been this way. The thorniest of all issues involving the two countries has always been the issue of prisoners. Uh, I frankly don't think there's going to be any kind of normal normalization of relations until the issue of prisoners is resolved. But there's a way to do it. We, you know, the, the, the case of the Cuban Five, of course, is with, you know, with the Supreme Court. It stands at about a 1% chance of being heard and about a half a 1% chance of winning. Those are the figures for most Supreme Court cases. Very difficult. But the fate of the Cuban Five is in the hands of the President of the United States, not nine judges on the Supreme Court. The President of the United States, thanks to the Constitution, has the power to release the Cuban Five for time served, commute their sentences. He can pardon them, but why pardon them? You know, they've served over 10 years in jail already. He can reduce their sentences and return them, and there's a historical precedent for this. A lot of people don't know it because it didn't receive any publicity. Cuba, through the ages, has done a great number of things where it didn't seek protagonism and people didn't find out about it. But back in the late 70s, there was a prisoner exchange involving Puerto Rican nationalists who were in jail in the United States for having shot up the U.S. Congress in Blair House. I think they even wounded um, then-Representative Gerald Ford with a bullet in his buttock. Yeah. And, um, 
those guys were in jail for a long, long time. And the U.S. was always talking about some prisoners in Cuba that they want to release, folks who had been working under their direction and control. Well, there was an exchange that took place. Um, the United States was asked by uh, the Cubans to release as a gesture, on a gesture for gesture basis, the Puerto Rican nationalists, without any linkage, but with a promise that there would be a reciprocal gesture along the way. The Puerto Rican nationalists were re released. 10 days later, Cuba released five individuals who were in Cuba. Um, some of them were Central Intelligence Agency um, employees or agents, or I don't know what you want to call them, but they were released. One of them was named Larry Lunt. They arrived in the United States. The Puerto Ricans are now in Puerto Rico. I was recently in Cuba and met one of them, a guy named Rafael Cancel Miranda. And um, yeah, it, it, it was interesting because his son was there. His son was in his late 20s. And he came up to the president of the National Assembly of Cuba, Ricardo Alarcón, and he says, I want to thank you, uh, President Alarcón. Um, I want to thank you for my existence. Because had it not been for Cuba, I would not be born because my father would still be in jail. Um, but you know, it, this is doable. There's a historical precedent for this. If there's a will, it can be done. It's in President Obama's hands to do this, uh, to release the Cuban five for time served. He can keep the convictions. I don't think Cuba cares. Cuba just wants their people back. In Cuba, there's a number of people that have been arrested in recent years for being under the direction and control of the U.S. intersection in Havana. Uh, there's also a handful of others who are in jail for collaborating with the U.S. intelligence services. The U.S. is always talking about these folks as political prisoners that Cuba should free. Well, I am sure that if the United States frees the five, there would be a reciprocal gesture. There are other issues. The case of Luis Posada Carril is a case that I was supposed to talk about, but really haven't. Um, but the Posada Carril's case is also a case that's in the hands of President Obama. He can apply the law. That's all he has to do. Posada Carriles is the Osama bin Laden of Latin America. He's a Frankenstein. He's a guy who blew up a passenger plane with uh, 73 people aboard, many of them young people, members of the Cuban fencing team. Um, there was a nine-year-old Guyanese girl on board. All of them were killed. Um, he continued his merry path of terrorism throughout Central America. He tried to blow up an auditorium at the University of Panama in the year 2000 that was full of students simply because he wanted to kill President Fidel Castro and his students happened to be there. As Posada said about the Italian tourist that he murdered in 1997 in Cuba, uh, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, Posada Carriles is free. He's walking the streets of Miami. He's being tried in the United States, yeah, but for perjury not for murder, not for terrorism. He's not been extradited. Venezuela asked for his extradition four years ago. It's never been denied. It's never been granted. It just sits there. And Posada Carriles is free to walk the streets of Miami to receive awards, to hobnob with other terrorists. Um, it, it's shameful. And it is not the way that this country should conduct its business. And it's certainly not the way to form any kind of relationship with other nations. Cuba feels for the victims of terrorism.